This is It Was a Thing on TV. Turn around, turn something like this to me. It's a time. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Episode 176, Submission 1776. The Bicentennial Minute. The Bicentennial Minute was a one-minute segment that aired on CBS from July 4th, 1974 to December 31st, 1976 for 732 episodes. Everyone's looking forward to the Bicentennial in 1976. And the people at CBS are saying to themselves, We need to get in on this. So what did they do? They decided to have a series of educational segments during their primetime programming, either at 8.27 p.m. or 8.57 p.m., and it would be a one-minute segment describing what happened on this day 200 years ago by somebody famous. And they would have this airing once a day, every day, in the lead-up to July 4th, 1976, starting on July 4th, 1974. So they got two years out of it. Or initially it was two years, but it was so successful they decided to keep it until the end of 76, so they got two and a half years out of it. Oh, yes. Now, the series was created by Ethel Wyant and Lewis Friedman of CBS, who had overcome the objections of network executives who considered the Bicentennial Minute to be an unworthy use of program time. The producer of the series was Paul Wagner, and the executive producer was Bob Markle, and the executive story editor and writer was Bernard Eisman from 1974 to 1976, and he was followed by Jerome Aden. Associate producer Merle Evans researched the historical facts for the broadcast, and in 1976, this series won an Emmy Award in the category of Special Classification of Outstanding Program and Individual Achievement, and it also won a Special Christopher Award in 1976, whatever that is. Uh, The Christopher Award would be uh, presented to producers, directors, and writers of books, films, and television specials that a verb the highest value... Of the human spirit. Oh, okay. It's given by the Christophers, which is a Christian organization founded in 1945 by the Marinol priest James Keller. Okay. Oh, that explains a lot then. Nice. Well, one thing I want to note. I mentioned that the executive producer of the series was a guy named Bob Markle. Now, he was actually a resident here on Long Island. As a matter of fact, unfortunately... He passed away last year. On January 25th, 2020, he passed away. But a lot of his materials are at Stony Brook University, which is nearby where I live. And one of the things that they had in a collection that he donated was information on the Bicentennial Minute. So I emailed somebody at Stony Brook University if they had any information about the Bicentennial Minute or anything at all. And the people at Stony Brook said they'd look into it, and they actually gave me, like, two index cards worth of information that had information about who did what minute on what day. Because I took copious amounts of research, Mike, as you know. Yes. Oh, yeah. We got. I went to, through newspaper articles. I went through YouTube. I went through anything I could find. And we also had some help with some listeners. Some listeners actually gave us some information. In fact, um, Allison, who uh, we interviewed on the pop break, she gave us some information about this segment for this episode. And we thank Allison very much for that. Yeah, yeah she was a big help. Thank you so much. Yeah. And also... I went through newspapers.com. I went through the New York Times archives. I went through everything. And this is the most complete list I could find regarding this. Okay. So let's go into the speakers for the Bicentennial Minute. 
starting on July 4th, 1974. And who did they get to be the first speaker of the Bicentennial Minute? Some would argue that he is the voice of God himself. Yes, Charlton Heston. Pretty good name to start off with. Oh, definitely. Well, yep. I'll say this. I guarantee you, there will not be one sighting of a damn dirty ape speaking on the Bicentennial Minute. Nope. No. Okay, July 6th, 1974. From the Waltons, Richard Thomas. Big name at the time on CBS. Yep. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. So, of course, they'd get somebody from CBS to do this. Oh, but another big name. July 8th, 1974. Gene Stapleton. Well, another big name on CBS. And, yeah. Yeah. And that's just the first week. Yeah. Well, other presenters of Premier Week that I found online are Richard Widmark, Ed Asner, James Franciscus, George Kennedy, Glenn Ford, and Gail Fisher. Of course, George Kennedy would be sometime in between airport movies and The Naked Gun. Yeah, and Glenn Ford, obviously, before he did Superman the movie as Clark Kent's dad. And Ed Asner would be on the Mary Tyler Moore show at this time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, July 1974. Now, I found this information on Getty Images. Now, according to the date on Getty Images, this was taped on July 26th, 1974. Author and historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Big name in historical circles. Oh, indeed. Not as big as this next name, though. Yeah, um, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. Okay. So on August of 1974, they got for the Bicentennial Man, they interviewed uh, this senator from Delaware. I don't know whatever happened to this guy. Um, his name's Joe Biden. Wasn't he on uh, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? Oh, that guy. Yeah. wonder what he's doing nowadays. I only wonder. But here's an interesting fact I found on Getty Images on the picture. Because this picture is on Getty Images of him doing the Bicentennial Minute. The date of the taping for the Bicentennial Minute, according to Getty Images, August 12th, 1974. And do you know why that's a big deal? Well, that would have been like four days after Nixon uh, resigned. Yes. So, yeah, because remember... It was a good chance Nixon was going to be impeached and it was going to go to the Senate for a trial. So that would have been crazy. I mean, if you really think about it, though, he's been involved, if you really think about it, in four of the five presidential impeachments in history. Because he would have been a juror in the Nixon trial. He was Had it actually gone to trial. Had it actually gone to trial. He was a juror, of course, in the Clinton impeachment trial in 1999. And, of course, he was directly involved in the two impeachment trials of... Mr. Black. Uh Uh-oh, we're going to get letters. Oh, Oh, don't start, Greg. Don't start. Well, it's not that. Mr. Black. Oh, okay. So you're saying he wasn't around for the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Okay. Oh, no, he didn't find a way to steal something back then. Unless he stole Ed Bagley's <laughs> TARDIS. I was just going to say, unless he stole Ed Bagley's TARDIS and went back to 1868 or whatever. Oh, no. All right. October 29th, 1974. Actress Nancy Walker. Oh, she would be on Blansky's Beauty soon. Oh, okay. she was on another. She was on another show. Rhoda, that's, what, that's the show she was on. Okay. That's the second mention of Blansky's beauties in in consecutive weeks. Yeah, because we mentioned in Earl Horror last week. Yeah. Okay. September 1974. Now, these two were taped, according to Getty Images, on September 6, 1974. Dr. Joyce Brothers and Gloria Steinem. Two uh, feminist icons. Uh, Yes. And, of course, Dr. Joyce Brothers probably the most famous contestant to come out of the $64,000 question. And not only that, but who could ever forget Dr. Joy's brother's cameo in The Naked Gun? Oh, yeah. Gold. Okay, so we have a list of names that I found from newspapers.com 
from September 1974. Okay. So I have the dates for these right now. Okay. September 2nd, 1974. Carol Burnett. Oh, oh. She was pretty big at the time. She was Ms. CBS. Well, well she's, st- she's still big, though. Still yeah. is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Taking nothing away from her. Nope. Yeah. September 3rd, 1974. Retired Lieutenant General James M. Gavin. American hero. September 8th, 1974. Meathead himself, Rob Reiner. Again, staying in the CBS family. Yeah. Never heard of him. September 9th, 1974. Patricia Neal. Okay, I'm guessing this is somebody else entirely. Because there, if you remember, there is Patricia Neal. There's the Patricia the- Neal who was the actress in such films as The Day the Earth Stood Still, A Face in the Crowd, and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Now that's that Patricia Neal. Yes. Okay, I thought you were talking about Fanny Black for a second. Go on. <laughs> but her name, she was born Patricia Neal. But that's why she changed her name. Okay, then. If it was Fanny Flag, he would have said Fanny Flag. What is it? But here's a nail. <laughs> September 10th, 1974. Hugh Hefner. Nice. Too bad there isn't a day that begins with 69. Nice. Fun. Maybe they could have recorded it five years earlier in 69. <laughs> I'm sorry. September 11th, 1974. Yule Gibbons. Yeah, he was a literary face of the crowd back in the 70s. Yeah, he was a big punchline on uh, Carson back in the day. Oh, Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. October 1974. Actress Dina Merrill tapes according to Getty Images on October 1st, 1974. And these two... Presumably taped, according to IMDb, on October 13th, 1974, Vincent Price in Lawrence Welk. Okay, those are like two polar opposites. Lawrence Welk and Vincent Price. Yeah. I I can't imagine them in the same room. Well, one's creepy and the other's campy. I'll leave it to uh, discuss which is which. One's creepy and the other is Vincent Price. (laughs) Okay. Now the next one. I was actually reading this before we started recording. Yeah. Try, okay. Well, trying to in the Lucy voice. Okay. Now this was around Thanksgiving on November 28th, 1974. You talk about people involved with CBS. This one is truly Miss CBS. Lucille Ball. Oh, yes. And there is a transcript that exists... And we'll include in the link in the liner notes of this episode on Podbean, on her Bicentennial Minute. And Chico, do you want to reenact Lucy's Bicentennial Minute for us? Now, I have to remember that this is uh, Lucy in the 70s, and her voice would just start to get a little bit gravelly, but here you go. (laughs) 200 years ago today... New England farmers were enjoying lively corn-shucking parties in the crisp night air. Corn was piled into great heaps, and bonfires burned in the fields. Young people ran and flirted in the shadows. A Yankee farmer remembered how it was. The neighboring swains are invited, and after the corn is finished, they give three cheers, but cannot carry the husks without a rum bottle. They feign great exertion, but do nothing until the rum enlivens them. Then all is done in a thrice. And when the work was done, the chairs in wild disorder flew quite around the room. Some threatened with firebrands, some brandished the broom. While others resolved to increase the uproar, lay tussing the girls in wild heaps on the floor. I am Lucille Ball, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Oh, and by the way, the closing line in every Bicentennial Minute is a reference to Walter Cronkite's close on the CBS Evening News. Yes, it's always, I'm, name of presenter here, and that's the way it was. 
And then you get a cheap plug for Shell Oil, which was the main sponsor for the first two years of the Bicentennial Minute from July 4th, 1974 to July 4th and 76. I'm guessing they were only contracted to sponsor it to the original intended date because there's no sponsor of it after. Well, actually, that's not true because according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia, it was sponsored by Raid until the end of 76. Oh, okay. All right. So, Mike, do you want to explain who did the voiceover portion that plugged Shell on the Bicentennial Minute? Yes. Uh, We talked about him last year, Ernie Anderson. And supposedly, according to a source, this is from the Cleveland Plain Dealer on December 7th, 1975. He stood to make a cool half a million dollars for his work just on the CBS Bicentennial Minute. Jeez. That's a lot of money for one line. Not bad work if you can find it. Oh, yeah. But also, I just had two other things to say. First, Greg. Yeah. Wow. That was a great Lucy impression. I thought she was right here with us. That's Chico who did the Lucy impression. I I, I know. I'm I'm commenting to you that that impression made it sound like Lucy was right here with us. Oh, it did. Uh, It sounded like a cheap smoker. I was trying, you see. I I was trying. You were trying. But also, I did want to add, uh, since you mentioned that that was uh, November 28th of 74. Yeah. Fittingly, that was Thanksgiving Day. So, obviously, you had to have a big day for Lucy. Yeah. Well, the Saturday that week, November 30th, 1974, Peter Lawford. Uh, What can we say about Peter Lawford? The Rat Pack. I mean, come on. Oh, and he was on future entry, the pilot of Monday Night Quarterback. Hey, that happened. He, yeah, he, he was like the lesser part of the Rat Pack. He, he was right there, maybe half a step above Joey Bishop. Okay. All right, December 1974. Presumably, according to INDB, taped on December 4th of 74. Oh. A guy who made his way around the circuit. Ross Morton. Oh, yeah. A great pyramid player. Okay. December 12th, 1974. Oh, here's a legend right here. Are you ready for this? Sherry Lewis. Was she doing it herself or was Lamb Chop helping? I presume she was doing it herself. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if Lamb Chop was along for the ride. Uh, It would have been awesome, too. Oh, oh, yes. That'd be great. Okay. December 17th, 1974. Now, Chico, you got to help me because I'm going to butcher the hell out of this. Uh, it was actor Soral. Is it Soral, Richard? I'm guessing? He was the guy that played Captain Hook and Peter Pan. So, Cyril Richard. Cyril Richard. Okay. Wherever I got this from freaking, uh, I'm guessing this was from... Stony Brook University that sent me the cards. Some of the names were spelled weird. Or yeah, done but wrong. Cyril, but yeah, but Cyril Richard, Peter Pan, uh, Australian actor, stage, screen, and yeah. Yeah. And what more can be said about his performance as Captain Hook and Peter Pan? He, um, I, I'm scared of this guy. Oh, yeah. When you saw him, run for the hills. Okay, let's get to 1975. Pretty good year, if you ask me. Oh, it's just, just my opinion. <laughs> okay. January 13th, 1975. Ralph Bellamy. Hey, you would best know him from Trading Places. And also, guys, he played FDR in The Winds of War. Yep. I wonder who played FDR in The Winds of Whoopi. I was oh, just going to say that. Oh, no. I Get out of my mind. Oh, jeez. No. Get out right now. You need to oh. pay rent if you're getting in there. Oh, boy. All right. January 18th, 1975. Ruby D. Oh, one of the uh, all-time legends in the silver screen. Ruby oh, D. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. R.I.P. January 19th, 1975, actor Leif Erikson. Not the explorer. It's an actor by the name of Leif Erikson. 
he was in like a bunch of stuff. I think it says right here on uh, his Wikipedia page, he was a guest star on the Mod Squad. So there you go. Oh, January 26, 1975. Mr. Hal, Jim Backus. Very nice. Yep. Took yeah. time off the island to deliver a bicentennial minute. Oh, yeah. Uh, you you got to assume that he did it by memory because Mr. Magoo probably couldn't see the cue cards. Oh, Mr. Oh. Magoo, he wouldn't see the cue cards for anything. Yep. I guess he was still feeling humble for being uh, hustled by Bobby Brady in pool. Oh, that's true. I forgot it. that episode where he hustled Bobby Brady. Well, it makes sense because Sherwood Swartz was the executive producer on the Brady Bunch, so of course he'd bring him on for the Brady Bunch. Okay. January 27th, 1975. Greg Morris. Of course, known for Mission Impossible, the original Mission Impossible, played uh, Barney Collier. And of course, we all know him as uh, Bill Morris's daddy. That's right. Yeah, the, the father of Jackie Childs. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. Okay, January 28th, 1975. Senator Richard Schwicker. Yep. January 29th, 1975. Robert Culp. Ah, I oh. spy. Yes. Uh, yeah, he did that show with another Mr. Black. <laughs> We're going to get letters. January 30th, 1975. Presumably, Warren Oates. Wikipedia says, American actor, best known for his performances in several films directed by Sam Peckinpah, including The Wild Bunch. And he played supporting character U.S. Army Sergeant Holka in the military comedy Stripes. Oh, yes! He's the guy that says lighten up Francis! Ah, uh, nice. I remember him. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then another known entity in January 31st, 1975, uh, Harry Morgan. And it's notable because he hadn't yet played Colonel Potter on MASH yet. Yeah, he'd be like a couple years. No, no. He, no he'd play it that year. That because, same year. Because that was the year McLean Stevenson left MASH. Right. He would still be known for uh, Dragnet. Yes. Oh, he was great on Dragnet, too. He was great on Dragnet. Oh, yeah. Dragnet's my TV cop drama wings. I thought that was CSI New York, but whatever. February 18th, 1975. John Amos. From Good Times, yeah. Good Times, but also two years later, Roots. Oh, Roots, yeah. Classic. Roots! Chico got that. I totally got that. March 2nd, 1975. Actor John Ireland. Canadian American actor and film director was nominated for an Oscar for his performance in All the King's Men, making him the first Vancouver born actor to receive an Oscar nomination. Oh, nice. Wow. Okay. So. March 3rd, 1975. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, Mark, this is March 3rd. This is the day I was born. Oh, yes. I forgot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. I hope it's better than John Ireland. You like Martin Balsam? (laughs) Yeah, I've heard of him at least. Okay. Oh, he was an early member of the Actors Studio. The -hmm. famous Actors Studio. Freaking, uh, what's his face? Uh, James Lipton. Yeah, James Lipton. Yeah, I wonder what his favorite swear word was. Anyway. His best known film roles include Drill Number One in 12 Angry Men, Detective Arbogast in Psycho. He was in Breakfast at Tiffany's as O.J. Berman. He was in The Taking of Film 123 in 1974 as Mr. Green. And he played Howard Simmons in All the President's Men. Which would have been a year later. That would have been 76. But he was juror number one in 12 Angry Men. And oddly enough, this is my birthday. One of my favorite movies of all time is 12 Angry Men. Oh, there you go. This is very coincidental. I like it. And he had a starring role on Archie Bunker's Place as Murray Klein. Yep. 
And that would be like at what, 1982, 83? Well, yeah. Uh, well, it says he says he was on Troop Bikes' Wikipedia for the entire run, so. Yeah, Archie so yeah, Bunkers 82, 83. No, 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 Archie Bunker's place started in 79. Oh. Yeah. A- after All in the Family got uh, okay. ended its run, yeah. Okay. Our next presenter that I have listed from March 22nd of 1975, the, at the time, governor of California, well, Ronald Reagan. Well, uh, uh, um, do you want a do you want a jelly bean? Everyone likes jelly beans. It probably was about jelly beans. Who knows? Maybe uh, the British had attacks on jelly beans, and he had said, "You know what? This is the one I have to present." Speaking of the next day, March twenty third, Burgess Meredith. <laughs> but this is notable because this is one year before Rocky. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Rocky was seventy six. Yeah. I mean, one of the greats. I mean, come on, the penguin on Batman. Good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> okay. Somewhere around April to May of 1975, taped according to Getty Images on April 25th of 1975, actor Kevin McCarthy. Known uh, primarily for portraying Biff Lohman in the 1951 Death of a Salesman. That's right. And also Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but Chico. We would know him best as R.J. Fletcher in the 1989 Weird Al Yankovic classic UHF. Classic! That's great. Yes. (laughs) Oh, he's terrific as the heel. And who can forget, Chico, that big epic heel promo he cuts near the end of the movie? Oh, yeah. Roll it right now. Yeah. And now, a special report from the owner and general manager of Channel 8, R.J. Fletcher. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I come before you tonight to speak on a matter which is of grave concern to us all. I want to show you how one small television station can single-handedly disrupt and destroy the moral fiber of an entire community. The following may upset you, it may even shock you. But I feel it is my duty as a concerned citizen to bring you this important message. This community means about as much to me as a festering bowl of dog snot. Do you think I care about the pea-brained yokels of this town? If you took their combined IQ and multiplied it by 100, you might have enough intelligence to tie your shoe. If you didn't drool all over yourself first. I can't stand those sniveling maggots. They make me want to puke. But there is one good thing about broadcasting to a town full of mindless sheep. I always know I've got them exactly where I want them. (laughs) <laughs> April 1975, taped presumably on April 12th, 1975. And we talked about him last month, guys. Patrick McNee. Oh. The prisoner. And also the Avengers. Yeah. And obviously, we talked about him in Thunder in Paradise, so... Chisel drizzle. Chisel drizzle. <laughs> All right, June 29th, 1975. Taped according to Getty Images on June 3rd. Actress Joanne Woodward. Oh. Oh, yeah. Classic. Of course, okay. that's known for being Paul Newman's wife. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah, she was. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have a week's worth of presenters that I have listed here from July of 1975. The U.S. Technical Director for the Apollo Soyuz Test Project, Glenn S. Lunny. Okay. And then I'm guessing this is because this is the sixth anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been July 20th of 69. Nice. There you go. Thank you. So, yeah, that would have been the sixth anniversary of that... uh, happening so we continue the theme on july 21st we have 
Apollo astronaut Vance Brand. Oh, July 22nd, 1975. Legendary actress of the stage, Melba Moore. Oh, gosh, she is everything. Oh, yeah. And she had her short-lived sitcom in 1986. That was one and done that will probably one day do a mini on. on. Yeah. There's a reason why it was one and done, but we won't say it here. All right, July 23rd, 1975. Actor Cliff Gorman. Don't know who that is. Cliff Gorman? Uh, yeah, he was a uh, stage and screen actor. A lot of these people have basically come from the stage and the screen. And if we're talking about television, the only thing I remember him as a guy number one in game number three of the September 3rd, 1965 episode to tell the truth. Wow. And when uh, Kitty Carlisle asked what he did for a living, he said he sold room air conditioners for the Republic Water Heater Company. Oh, that Kitty Carlisle. <laughs> Snooping out to find out who the imposter is. Okay. A little later than that, in 1979, he played a Dustin Hoffman-like character who is portraying Lenny Bruce uh, in a side story in the film All That Jazz. Davis Newman. His name is Davis Newman. Again, I'll take your word for it. Okay. July 25th, 1975. Pianist Peter Nero. Oh, oh p- a guy who plays the piano. Okay. Yes. What do you think I was saying? Next! Chico! <laughs> Bad Chico! July 26th, 1975. Postmaster General Benjamin Franklin Beller. Or Blar. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. Well, all right. So this is the first Bicentennial Minute that we actually have some footage of. Okay. That's on YouTube. Okay. This is Congresswoman Bella Abzug of New York. So this is like the first of about a dozen or 13 of the minute that's on YouTube. So I figured I'll just play it here on the screen share. So it'll save us some time in the editing room. So here we go with the first Bicentennial Mint that's available on YouTube chronologically. This is Bella Abza, Congresswoman from New York. 200 years ago today, a Royal Navy sloop spotted militiamen trying to haul cannon away from New York's battery. A signal flare went up from the sloop to alert the man of war Asia farther out in the harbor. On shore, a nervous militiaman mistook the flare for a shot and fired at the sloop. The sloop fired back. Then the Asia raked the waterfront with a 32-gun broadside. New Yorkers were stunned. They'd avoided doing anything to anger the British, but a radical minority had seized control of the Provincial Congress and ordered the cannon hauled away. The Asia's guns didn't recognize New Yorkers' political differences. The guns had been aimed at all of them. Now they knew they'd have to choose sides. I'm Bella Abzug, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Thank you, Ernie. All right. I, I actually need to give credit to the people that did Bicentennial Minute because I'm sure it was very difficult and challenging to find stuff that happened on essentially random days in 1774, 1775, 1776. Now, obviously, yeah, you, you had a little bit more relevance as you got closer to, to 76, to July 4th to 76. Oh, yeah. But yeah, just saying like, uh, on this date, on February 9th of 1975, yeah, George Washington took a pee or something like that. It's it, it, it just, you know, trying to find something relevant for that day seems like it'd be a real challenge. And not just relevant, but also interesting. Yeah. All right. So the second earliest available Bicentennial Minute segment is on YouTube from the following week on August 31st, 1975. And that is actress Jessica Tandy. 
Oh, pr- oh priceless. God. Driving Drive Miss Daisy, people. That's her big one, yes. She's an American treasure. She's a legend, yep. Oh, yeah. Her and Hume Cronin. Oh, what more needs to be said? Especially Cocoon and Batteries Not Included. Two of my favorites as a kid. But okay, here we go from August 31st, 1975. This is Jessica Tandy. 200 years ago today, British work gangs were stripping Boston bare of wood, piling up firewood for the winter ahead. The giant elm that for 120 years shaded the corner of Washington and Essex streets was gone. The elm had been Boston's liberty tree. For 10 years, patriots met there to denounce British tyranny. Then the British came with axes to chop the living symbol down. An onlooker described their glee. He said, after a long spell of laughing and foaming with malice, they cut down a tree because it bore the name of liberty. The liberty tree yielded 14 cords of wood, but one red coat, hacking away at a high branch, slipped and fell to his death. The Liberty Tree died, but not without a struggle. I am Jessica Tandy, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. And actually, for the longest time, that was mostly, for a while, at least online, the only segment from the Bicentennial Minute that was available. Because this was uploaded, I believe, by TV Party on YouTube on May 27, 2008. Shout out to the TV Party. Yeah. They crawled so we could walk. Yeah. All right, so let's continue on. November 1975, taped according to Getty Images on November 12, 1975. Paul Newman. There you go. We talked about Joanne Woodward just a few minutes ago. Yes. I was just going to say... Known, of course, for being uh, Mr. Joanne Woodward. <laughs> but Among of course... other things, let's just say that. <laughs> okay. All right. November 12th, 1975, South Carolina Congressman Butler Derrick. And actually, there is some material relating to his bicentennial minute appearance online, and we'll include it in the liner notes also. There's actually a press release from the University of South Carolina University Libraries that highlights his upcoming appearance on the bicentennial minute. So that's kind of neat. I like the fact that the the, um, the header has like his picture on it and it has like all these bright colors on it. Oh, it's nice. His office spared no expense. Okay. December 1975, taped according to Getty Images on December 4th, Kirk Douglas. Yes. Legend. Yes. And what more needs to be said about him? In fact, what, wouldn't Michael Douglas be doing Streets of San Francisco around this time? Yes, he would. Obviously, of course, he was doing that while uh, working for Howard Stark. Hello. Got your pen? That would be the number that you called, yes? This is Captain Stevens from Shipping. We have a package for you. Bring it up. Well, that's the thing, sir. We can't. I'm confused. I thought that was your job. Well, it's just... Sir, the box is glowing, and to be honest, some of our mail guys aren't feeling that great. They didn't open it, did they? Uh, yeah, they did. You better get down here. See, Chico got it. He would have been doing Streets of San Francisco because it ran from 72 to 77. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So other speakers in 1975 that it found but did not have a date attached to it are the following. House Speaker Carl Abbott, House Majority Leader Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts, General Omar Bradley. Oh, this is a name. This guy actually hosted SNL. White House Press Secretary for Gerald Ford, Ron Neeson. Yeah. Robert Goulet. (laughs) Bobby Goulet. Yes. Maya Angelou. Another American treasure. Yes, absolutely. Former California Governor Pat Brown. Jerry's dad. Yeah. And, oh, a legend in New York City. Newspaper reporter Jimmy Breslin. 
Oh, oh yes. Yeah. He, he's another journalistic legend, yes. Oh, yeah. And he appeared on previous installment, The Critic. Live from Columbia University, the only award show not to be televised, it's the Pulitzer Prize Ceremony with your host, Mr. Jimmy Breslin. Tonight, we will honor the greatest writers in America with a modest 9 by 12 certificate and a check for $3,000. $3,000? Stephen King makes that for writing boo on a cocktail napkin. Well, anyway, the award for best criticism goes to... This is the worst production of Porgy and Bess I've ever seen. Jay Sherman. Yes! So now we're into 1976, folks. So now we have our next segment that's available on YouTube. It's from actor Lawrence Luckinbill. Well, first thing I can tell you is he's still with us. Oh, yep. my God. He still is. Oh, uh, my God. Hold up, guys. Time out. Time out. Okay. Uh, yeah. Stop it. Stop. Stop it right there. Time out. You he... mean to tell me that from 1980 onward, he was married to Lucy Arnaz. That's yeah. Not, that's not where I was going with this, but okay. Yeah, I know where Greg's going with it, but yes, he's been married to Lucy Arnaz for over 40 years. Oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. He also played Spock's half-brother, Cybok. In Star Trek V, yes! What does God need with a starship? Okay, here we go. Lawrence Luckinbill, Spock's half-brother, doing the Bicentennial Minute from January 8th of 1976. Here we go. I'm Lawrence Luckendall. Two yeah, you years are. ago today, a red coat sentry rushed up on stage at Boston's Faneuil Hall and shouted, The rebels are attacking. The audience roared with laughter. On the stage, soldiers were acting out the blockade of Boston, staged to help boost British troop morale in the besieged city. At first, the Englishmen and their Tory friends thought the sentry was just another actor in the play. But minutes later, soldiers, some in costume, were running from the stage. The alarm was real. Rebels had already killed one redcoat and taken half a dozen others prisoner in an attack on Charleston. Ten houses were burning. It had all happened while the British were laughing at those oafish Yankees bumbling around on the stage. I'm Lawrence Luckenbill. And that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. This is CBS. Okay. Now, you see, I thought that was a very interesting one. That, that didn't seem as random, but I thought that was a very interesting one uh, regarding the play, and people thought it was part of the play. Oh, it yeah. Sort of, sort of reminds me of, uh, what would it be, about 90 years later, uh, 89 years later with Lincoln at uh, uh, Our American Cousin? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, the president's falling over. Wait, wait a minute, that's not supposed to. This isn't part of the act. Okay, so next, from January 22nd, 1976, and this is on YouTube, actor Gary Lockwood. Now, Gary Lockwood would be best known for his roles as astronaut Frank Poole in 2001 A Space Odyssey and played Lieutenant Commander Gary Mitchell in the second Star Trek pilot episode, where no man has gone before. And he also played the title role in the series The Lieutenant from 1963 to 1964. And actually, still with us today. Still going strong at the age of 84. So that's good. Okay, here's Gary Lockwood's segment from January 22nd, 1976. I'm Gary Lockwood. 200 years ago today, loyalists in New York's Queens County waited in fear. Patriots were rifling through voting records, and anyone who dared to vote against the rebels in a recent election was marked for arrest. Congress had sent militiamen to check on rumors that the loyalists were smuggling in guns from British ships. Armed men went from house to house searching. They arrested 788 Queens County men and forced them to sign loyalty oaths. Eighteen were taken to Philadelphia, where members of Congress could question them closely. But no real evidence was found. They were sent back to New York. 
Still, Patriots kept him in jail for a month. The Tories were finally allowed to go home only after they paid heavy fines. I'm Gary Lockwood, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. February to March of 1976, presumably taped on February 26, 1976, according to IMDb, Victor Bruno, is that? Victor Bruno. Victor Bruno. Yeah, Victor Bruno. American actor. Yeah, known primarily for... Oh, uh, King Tut on Batman! Yeah. Oh, my God. So we had the Penguin, and now we have King Tut. Oh, that's great. And, of course, we can't forget his myriad of comedy records where he says, We are what we eat, said a wise old man, and, Lord, if that's true, I'm a garbage can. And only, oh, margarine, I'll never mutter, for the road to hell is spread with butter. And cake is cursed, and cream is awful, and Satan is hiding in every waffle. Give me this day my daily slice, but cut it thin and toast it twice. <laughs> that was the fat man's prayer. Ah. Oh. Sounded like Dollar Store Nipsey Russell. I bet he did a bicentennial minute Nipsey Russell. Uh, oh, probably. He had to. He had to. Do you know who did one that was taped on March 8th, according to Getty? Oh, who, Chico? This is Dick Clark. Oh, yeah. You can't have something about the celebration of America without somebody who represents the bandstand of America. Yeah, you cannot talk about the American Revolution without talking about the king of Philadelphia. Just saying. Yeah, just forget it. If you don't have Dick Clark, a man who's Philly, you can just forget it. Okay, the next segment that's available on YouTube, March 9th of 1976, actor Jim Hutton, who, by the way, was best known for his screen partnership in four films with somebody who we've talked about in the past on this podcast in the 1978 Science Fiction Film Awards, Paula Prentice, Mm -hmm. the wife of Richard Benjamin. Yep. And also Jim Hutton is best known as the father of actor Timothy Hutton. Really? Yes. Well, also, also we should add around this time he played Ellery Queen. On Ellery Ah, Queen. there you go. Oh, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, okay. that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I found this. This was hidden in a thing on YouTube called 1975 Commercials. Yeah, this is how much of a deep dive I went. I went through 1975 Commercials to see if there's anything existing on the Bicentennial Minute. And ironically, this is not from 1975. So, whatever. Okay, here's Jim Hutton with the Bicentennial Minute from March of 76. I'm Jim Hutton. 200 years ago today, rebel militia squads left Manhattan, heading for a marshy cove on Jamaica Bay. Their orders? Arrest Frank James and his friends. They resist? Kill them. James and his people were New York harbormen whose job it was to safely pilot ships in and out of port. But someone brought word to the rebel command that the pilots were steering American ships straight for waiting British men of war. Now the rebels knew why. Harbor pilots were being paid by the British to bring unsuspecting ships under Royal Navy guns. When the raiders got to the harbormen's cove, it was empty. The pilots had been warned. It slipped away sailing their own boats to safety with the British fleet offshore. I'm Jim Hutton, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Oh, hold up. We got another Bicentennial Minute that's on YouTube from nine days later, from March 18th of 1976, and that is actor Val Avery. And as a matter of fact, if you listen to the 2020 Year in Review show, and we've had the preview of 2021. You've actually already heard the tail end of this. Yep. For the record, Val Avery, a that guy from that thing. Yes, he's very much a that guy from that thing. We can't go a show without mentioning the that guy from that thing. But it does note that he was born in Philadelphia, so. Yes. So that makes him very worthy of this. Okay. Oh, totally. Totally. All right. So here we go 
from March 18th of 1976, Val Avery. I'm Val Avery. 200 years ago today, General Washington rode slowly through Boston's grimly quiet streets. It wasn't a city he remembered from a visit 20 years earlier. The British, who'd been gone for less than 24 hours, had left it a shambles. Shade trees were gone, chopped up for firewood, along with houses, fences, wharves, even churches. The streets were littered with junk left behind in the hurried evacuation. When Washington rode into Boston, almost no one recognized him. Frightened civilians peered from behind closed shutters. The British still had troop ships in the harbor, but soon they'd sail. Washington would go to New York, and it would be years before Boston erased the memory that it had been an occupied city. I'm Val Avery, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Okay, now this next one from April 2nd, 1976 exists, but only the last five seconds exists. But we do have thanks to Fuzzy Memories for preserving this. From April 2nd of 1976. Darren McGavin. The old man. Yeah. Yes. But also we'll be talking about him this Halloween. Because he was in Kolchek the Night Stalker. Oh, I can't wait for that episode. And in case you're wondering how the last five seconds of that Bicentennial Minute sounds, we'll play it right here. I'm Darren McGavin. And that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Okay, May 7th, 1976, we have producer, director, Hollywood legend, Otto Preminger. I'm Otto Preminger. 200 years ago today, Thomas Jefferson left his home in Monticello, Virginia, to return to Congress. He had been home since the first of the year with his dying mother. When he got back to Philadelphia, the 33-year-old Virginian found the mood of Congress changed. Now his radical ideas about independence were acceptable. Immediately, Jefferson was given an important assignment, and he moved to 230 High Street, where he could work comfortably. Said Jefferson, in that parlor, I wrote habitually, this paper particularly. This paper was the Declaration of Independence. I'm Otto Preminger, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. I like how they mixed it up with a fanfare as we got closer to July 4th. Did you notice that? I did. Another thing I'm noticing is as we're getting closer to July 4th of 76, the stories are becoming more interesting. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, nothing's happening. Some some rumblings going on, but then you get to 1776, and next thing you know, it is the opening act of Hamilton. Yeah, there's something happening every day. It's, it's fascinating. I, I wish that there actually was like a book of all the bicentennial minutes, just detailing everything from July 4th of 74 to the end of 76. I would buy that. I, I, I imagine inter- Keith Law already has a copy of that book, but I will ask her eventually. Yeah, it, it would be cool to have like all 900 entries or whatever it is in that two and a half year span. I personally think. I think as a historical about, document, yeah. that would be great. Yeah, I think that's about uh, 800. Okay, our next one from May 12th, 1976. It's on YouTube. Actor Mitchell Ryan. Now, Mitchell Ryan... Oh, my God. He played Burke Devlin in Dark Shadows and appeared as Thomas Gibson's father, Edward Montgomery, on Dharma and Greg. And you're not going to believe this. He was the villain, General Peter McAllister, in Lethal Weapon. What? Not joking. And still with us, actually, as of the time we're recording this. Okay. 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 All right, May 12th, 1976, Mitchell Ryan. I'm Mitchell Ryan. 200 years ago today, 
a 50-year-old New York patriot wearily kept signing his name. Sugar merchant Isaac Roosevelt was in charge of issuing the colony's paper money. He had to personally sign every bill twice. When New York needed cash, Roosevelt found bills that had never been issued. He promised to get them ready immediately. He started signing bills in denominations that ranged from an eighth of a dollar to ten dollars. Within two weeks, $137,000 was issued. New York's paper money was backed only by the Patriots' promise. And the signature of the man who was the great, great, great grandfather of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What? I'm Mitchell Ryan. And that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Okay, that was fascinating. He hand signed each bill twice. And within, how long did they say? A couple of weeks or a month or so? Yeah. There was like $130-some-thousand in circulation, and the most expensive bill was a $10 bill? <laughs> that is fascinating. Oh, yeah. Wow. And oh. not to mention he was a relative of FDR. Oh, yeah. Man. Okay. May 20th, 1976. We have, and it's on YouTube, Conductor... Zubin Meta, presumably no relation to the bookworm. And you can't talk about the high arts without including Zubin Meta in the conversation. Oh no, you just can't. You can't. Let's see what he has to say. All right, here we go from May twentieth, nineteen seventy-six. I'm Zubin Meta. 200 years ago today, 4,000 people stood in the courtyard of Philadelphia's old state house. They had come to show popular support for independence. Inside, on the second floor, Pennsylvania's staunchly conservative anti-independence assembly was meeting. Outside, the crowd listened to patriot speakers, and by noon, they had peacefully but firmly let the frightened legislators inside know that there would be a new government for Pennsylvania. They called the assembly a body of men bound by oath and allegiance to our enemy. The protest ended with a demand that a new constitution be drawn up for Pennsylvania. Laws would no longer come from the crown, but from the authority of the people. I'm Zubin Mehta, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. I think at this point of the show, if you had a drinking game of these historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. You'd be on the ground in the fetal position. Yeah. Singing La Carmina Barana. Definitely. Okay. The following week, May 27th, 1976, actor-director Garson Kanan. Noted American writer and director of various plays and films over the years. So here we go. Let's see what he has to say from... May 27th, 1976. Starting to get good, guys. Oh, yeah, we're getting closer and closer to the good stuff. Here we go. I'm Garson Kanan. 200 years ago today, a 50-year-old Virginia planter and scholar delivered the document that Virginia's convention had asked him to write. Virginia's wanted a new constitution. In this draft, George Mason included ideas never before offered, that all men are born equally free and independent, that a man's natural rights included the enjoyment of life and liberty with means of pursuing happiness. Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights also guaranteed freedom of the press and of religion. Within days, a copy was on the way to Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. He would use his fellow Virginians' ideas as a basis for his draft of the Declaration of Independence. I'm Garson Kanan, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. I'm going to concur with what you guys said earlier, and I did mention this earlier. Like, from the start in 74 up until probably about, I'd say, I would assume July 4th of 75, maybe even up to January 1st of 76. I could see this being tedious, but since in like the year leading up to July 4th of 1976, 
these are progressively getting more and more interesting. It's a slow build. It's yeah. a very slow build, but I can see why people didn't like it back in 74 and 75. Hey, America wasn't built in a day, okay? No. Okay, but here we go. The following week, June 4th, 1976, Senator from South Carolina, Senator Fritz Hollings. And I'll have a lot to say about this guy because oh. this guy has one of the most amazing voices, Southern voices that I've ever heard in my life. Let's hear what he has to say from June 4th of 1976. I'm Senator Fritz Hollings of South Carolina. 200 years ago today, at Charleston, 50 British troop ships had dropped anchor offshore. Redcoats from England and Boston were on board. Their orders? Quell the rebellion in the South. Charleston expected an attack at any hour. General Charles Lee, Washington's second in command, got to the city on June 8th. He didn't know how long he'd have to put up defenses. The British delayed for three weeks, and when they finally came ashore, Virginians and Carolinians were waiting. Just days before independence was proclaimed, they beat back Britain's first major attempt to land troops in the colonies. I'm Senator Fritz Hollings, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Okay. And, and one month before the uh, Declaration on Independence in July 4th, to the date... He sounds like he comes from money, and he sounds like that money came from slavery. South Carolina? Never. No. Well, also, we should add, in case you don't know who Fritz Hollings was, he was a long-time senator, 1966 to 2005. Wow! Yeah, so, so I mean, when you said the name and we're talking about his accent, it's like, y- y- this is a guy who served a really long time in the Senate. This isn't like a one-term senator. He served like, what, seven terms, eight terms? Yeah, this isn't like Joe Biden, who at the time, of course, he'd become very famous later on, but at the time, he was only like a first-term senator. Yeah. I mean, this is like somebody who's like made his name in the Senate. This is like people in Washington knew who Fritz Hollings was. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we're heading into the week leading up to July 4th, 1976. Now, I will mention right here that the person that did the Bicentennial Minute on July 4th, 1976 was First Lady Betty Ford. Now, the Gerald Ford Presidential Library and Museum has... A lot of stuff relating to the Bicentennial Minute that Betty Ford did on the week leading up to July 4th. And one of them is a press release relating to the Bicentennial Minute to the July 4th, 1976 date. So here are the presenters for the minute leading up to July 4th, 1976. Here we go. June 27th, 1976, actress Mary Stewart. If I'm not mistaken, she was actually on a soap opera to maybe, I don't know. She had originated the role of Joanne Turner on Search for Tomorrow. Okay, because that was on CBS at the time, right? Yes. Okay, so that makes sense. All right. June 28th, 1976 the director of the National Gallery of Art, Carter Brown. June 29, 1976, Senator from Maryland, Charles Mathias Jr. But it also has Big C. Hey, maybe it's the Big C that that custodian from McDonald's was trying to find all this time. He was doing the Bicentennial Minute. Perhaps. I I don't think so. Oh. Okay. June 30th, 1976, Phyllis George. I believe she would be uh, working in, at CBS in the sports department at this time. Yeah, because she would have been doing the NFL Today at this time. And of course, yeah, this would have been first year of NFL Today uh, coming into the second year because NFL Today would have started in 75. And of course, Phyllis George, former Miss America. Yeah. 
July 1st, 1976, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. And hey, now God, we're getting to the big names. Now oh, we're yeah. getting to the big names, but hey, Mike. Yeah. You know what Nelson Rockefeller was most famous for, right? Oh, no. Oh, boy. Just, just say it. He died allegedly while boning somebody. Go ahead, everybody. No, no. We haven't gone to zero hour yet. Still have a couple days. July 2nd, 1976. Former Senator Nathan Fulbright. July 3rd, 1976. Marion Anderson. Of course, she, uh, an American contralto, and I believe she was actually asked to uh, be a goodwill ambassador to the U.S. Department of State. Okay. All right, but here we go with the biggie. July 4th, 1976. First Lady Betty Ford. And now we have the transcript from the Gerald Ford Presidential Library. And it says, Congress adopts a Declaration of Independence. So I'm going to read this. Are you ready? Okay, Greg, go for it. I am Betty Ford. 200 years ago today, late on a muggy Philadelphia afternoon, John Hancock called for a vote in Congress. Two days earlier, delegates had approved Virginia's resolution cutting all ties to Britain. Since then, they'd spent hours arguing over and revising Thomas Jefferson's draft of a formal Declaration of Independence. Point by point, the document recounted the colony's 11-year-long bitter struggle with the crown. It was finally adopted, but with little ceremony. Only John Hancock and Secretary Charles Thompson signed it right then and there. John Adams knew what the future had in store. The Americans, he said, would pay with toil and treasure and bloodshed to maintain this decoration. One struggle was over. A new and longer one was just beginning. I'm Betty Ford, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. Well, that would have been the last time you heard it. Yeah. What Greg just read appears to be possibly the original version because uh, in the same document, uh, there's a revised version for July 4th, 1776, Bicentennial Minute. Uh, I have that in front of me. Okay, (laughs) so you're going to read it. I'm Betty Ford. 200 years ago today, there was a new idea, a new sound, a new voice in the world. The Second Continental Congress spanked the new country into being by approving Jefferson's Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. It was a chicken-scratched, argued-about, finely-edited, dog-eared document the President of Congress and the Secretary signed and sent down to the official printer. Contrary to popular myth, the perfect parchment version we all know wasn't made until August, when most delegates signed. Some signed later. Some didn't sign at all. Matter of fact, many names were kept secret for a time in fear of British reprisals. The declaration has been called, and I quote, a prose lyric of civil and military heroism, a war song, a chant of human freedom. Because of it, 200 years ago today, a new voice was heard in the world, simply the United States of America. I'm Betty Ford, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. And then there was a revision to that revision. Oh! How many different Bicentennial Minutes did uh, Betty Ford do? Oh my gosh! This is the final cut. This was the one they went with. Okay, here we go. (laughs) I'm Betty Ford. 200 years ago today, there was a new idea. A new sound. A new voice in the world. The Second Continental Congress spanked the new country into being by approving Jefferson's Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. John Hancock and Secretary Charles Thompson signed. Contrary to popular myth, most delegates didn't sign until August. Some signed later. Some refused to sign at all. 
Little did any of them know that at the same time the declaration was approved, about 10,000 British troops were setting up camp on Staten Island, unopposed. But John Adams foresaw the toil and blood and treasure this venture would cost. 200 years ago today, a new voice was heard in the world. The United States of America. I'm Betty Ford, and that's the way it was. These historic minutes are sponsored each night by Shell. So taking a look at this document, it looks like around May of 1976, we had the first version, which Greg read, and then June 9th, the revision that I read was given to Betty Ford, and then the revision to that revision (laughs) was given to her on, it looks like, June 11th of 76, and it was recorded on June 14th of 1976. A lot of uh, work went into these minutes. And, and then actually on June 21st of 76, a waiver form was sent uh, regarding the bicentennial minutes to Betty Ford. So everything was nice and legal. Yeah, I got a lot of legalese, yes. Yep. And then actually uh, June 21st of 76 uh, was a press release regarding the entire week from June 27th to, to July 4th, all of the, the bicentennial minutes that we had mentioned. I didn't right. think that this would be the end of the story. No, it's not. It's just the beginning. No, they kept it going. We need to find out what happened after July 4th and into New Year's Eve. So, okay, here we go. July 22nd, 1976, and this is on YouTube. Will Rogers Jr., so let's go to July 22nd, 1976, and hear Will Rogers Jr. I'm Will Rogers Jr. 200 years ago today, Congress began to debate the Articles of Confederation. Many delegates thought it would take about 10 days to construct the national government, but the small states feared being crushed for the big ones. Everybody argued about whether states would be taxed by territory or population. Soon Congress was deadlocked and disgusted. It'd take longer than 10 days to construct a government. The Articles of Confederation wouldn't be ratified for another five years. We'd all learn that proclaiming a union of states was one thing, but making it work, that was something else. I'm Will Rogers, Jr., and that's the way it was. Yeah, did you notice something different? Yeah. Shell was missing. Where am I supposed to get gas now, Amico? Uh, it's very interesting. You know, we, we in the two years before July fourth of of nineteen seventy six, all of the bicentennial minutes had to do with the fight. Now we're in the era where we've got the independence. Now we're actually creating the country. We're developing the backbone of the country. Yep. Yes. And also building up to war with England. Yes. All right. So here we go. We got some other stuff that I got from Stony Brook University on the uh, card from the files of Bob Markle, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the producer of the Bicentennial Minute. And most of these are – this actually helped because this was all the stuff from later on after July 4th which I did not have much material for, so I'm very thankful for Stony Brook University for giving me this information. Okay, September 10th, 1976. You could say this one is very interesting. Artie Johnson. And then on September 11th, 1976, you have Christopher Plummer, who is addressed as Chris Plummer, who we talked about a couple months ago with Counter-Strike. Yeah. I can't believe that. Believe it. And then September 25th of 1976. I think this is a very interesting name because this would have been relatively early on in his career. This would have been about six years after Doonesbury premiered or Mm -hmm. debuted. Gary Trudeau. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we all know who Gary Trudeau is married to. Yeah. Jane Pauley. Yep. Yep. The, The current host of CBS Sunday Morning. And then check this out, man. 
October 1st, 1976, Sammy Davis Jr., man. If you don't know who Sammy Davis Jr. is, what podcast are you even listening to? If you don't know who Sammy Davis Jr. is, you're clearly under the age of like 25. Yeah. This next one, I find this interesting that this is over two days, October 5th and October 6th. You had Kukla, Fran, and Ali. Well, I think that makes sense because I think two of them, uh, did two of them speak or did all three speak? Because if two spoke, okay, one could have done October 5th, the other could have done October 6th. Yeah, that would make sense. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. And then you have uh, October 29th, Sandy Duncan. And October 31st, 1976. How are we going to skip Sandy Duncan without talking about the Hogan family? Come on. And those Wheat Thins commercials. And her glass eye. I wasn't going to mention it, Mike, but yeah, her glass eye. I didn't even know she had a glass eye. I didn't know either. Oh, and Sandy I think it's Duncan. a rumor. Oh, but do you know Sandy Duncan was in one of my all-time favorite Disney movies, Mike? And you know where I'm going with this. Oh, no. Where she, are you going with this? She was in the movie Million Dollar Duck with Dean Jones. Oh, no. So, okay, continue, Chico. And for the record, yes, Sandy Duncan lost vision in a, a left eye, but she never lost the eye proper. Oh, you know, that's interesting. On either end in our listings, we have Sammy Davis Jr. and Sandy Duncan. Put them together. You've got a set of eyes. Good night, everybody. Oh. Just, just an observation. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Thanks. Thanks. We're moving thanks. on. Quick, quick, fast, fast. Uh, October, October 31st, 1976, Boston Mayor Kevin White. Another one that makes sense. Because Boston. November 5th, 1976, actress Elsa Lanchester. It was spelled Lancaster on the cord Stony Brook gave me. Yeah, but it was Elsa Lanchester, British stage actress who is actually in another one of your favorite Disney movies, Greg. That darn cat. Oh, that's classic. Not really that big on that darn cat. I'm oh, going to be really? honest. I thought really? they were your favorites. No, Million Dollar Duck is like one of my all-time favorites. Okay, I see that. I see it. Well, and, and but, the shaggy dog. Yeah, yeah I was shaggy just about dog. To say. Yeah, all the shaggy dogs. Not the 2006 Tim Allen one. Less said about that, the better. And next, uh, uh, November 24th, 1976, puppeteer Bill Baird. He created Pinocchio's nose in the 68 Hallmark Hall of Fame Pinocchio. That guy is a legend. And then you have, uh, in December of 1976, it was taped, according to Getty Images, on December 4th, 1976, Tennessee Williams, an American literary icon. A legendary playwright, yes. Yes. And December 1st, 1976, folk singer Oscar Brand. But then, December 3rd, 1976, I know I'm asking for it now, Poland. Oh, jeez. Nothing, guys, really? I said, oh, jeez. Oh, okay. He of the Poland show and the Poland Halloween Spectacular, and also something about uh, Peter Marshall. Yeah, something tic-tac-toe Hollywood... Squares? Squares? I don't know. Yeah. And then on December 8th, 1976, legendary actor George Burns. Absolutely. It's like, it was like we start out with the voice of God, we're going to end with a voice of God. Because George Burns played God. Well, that would have been about a year and a half later. That was 78, yeah. I think. Yeah. And then on December 20th, you have, Greg, you actually have this on YouTube, Emlyn Williams. Who in the world is Emlyn Williams? Emlyn Williams, according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia, was a Welsh writer, dramatist, and actor. Ah. Okay, so on YouTube, and this is from Fuzzy Memories, and this was found rather recently 
it was in like a pile of stuff from December 20th, 1976 regarding Rhoda, Phyllis, and Maud. And this they, was, they exist in the same uh, cinematic universe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something like that. Okay. This is from December 20th, 1976, but the card from Stony Brook University also had him for December 21st, 1976. So, I don't know. Here we go. From December 20th, 1976. Here we go. should be noted that, as of this recording, this is the latest available Bicentennial Minute on YouTube. In a complete form, that is. Yes. Here we go. I'm Emlyn Williams. 200 years ago today, sounds of life coming from the boarded up John Street Theatre were British. The enemy now occupied what was left of New York City after the September fire. With Christmas coming, General Howe decided to give his men a theatre season and renamed the playhouse the Theatre Royal. They played the American premieres of Sheridan's The Rivals and The School for Scandal. But the actors were only as durable as the British Army. When the war was over, seven years later, the American company of comedians returned to their old home, the John Street Theatre, and the New York stage was back in business. I'm Emlyn Williams, and uh, that's the way it was. <coughs> when real people with real cold discover how it works, the word gets around. Hello, contact. <laughs> the hell was that? <laughs> that was our first ever commercial, I think. I don't know. <laughs> that, that may be edited out. I don't know what the hell that was. <laughs> no, that's more funny. <laughs> I don't know. What would the people at Wilkins think? Anyway. <laughs> okay, December 24th, 1976. Bing Crosby. Oh, they're really bringing out the big guns for these last couple of days. They've oh. saved their biggest gun for last, but we'll get there. Yeah, we're getting there, but there, there's another big gun coming up right now. Yeah. December 27th, 1976. Leonard Bernstein. But the final Bicentennial Minute, and the longest Bicentennial Minute, at least according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia was delivered by then-President Gerald Ford. Now, we talked about Betty Ford's remarks existing in the Presidential Library and Museum. President Ford's remarks also in the museum there. But I'm looking at the memo, and it didn't seem like too long a read here. I'll go ahead and deliver it if you don't mind. Good evening. More than two years ago, we began our bicentennial celebration. It was a time to take a fresh look at our past and to move forward together into our future. These bicentennial minutes have focused attention on all aspects of the birth of our nation, which established American freedom and kept its promise alive. The bicentennial year and the bicentennial minute ends tonight. As our first resolution of the new year, let us pledge to keep the spirit of 76 alive. Thank you, and a happy new year to you all. I'm sorry, just seemed empty at the end. Yeah, good, good call, Mike, good call. In the last 42 seconds of this, Chico, actually exists on YouTube. Really? Yes. Do you want to hear the last 42 okay. seconds? Why, yes. Yes, I do. Here we go. Yeah, we got to close out the Bicentennial Minute. Here we go. Gerald Ford. At our path. And to move forward together into our future. These Bicentennial Minutes have focused attention on all aspects of the birth of our nation which established American freedom and kept its promise alive. The bicentennial year and the bicentennial minutes end tonight. As our first resolution of the new year, let us pledge to keep the spirit of 76 alive. Thank you and a happy new year to you all. This is CBS. 
That's such a fitting way to end it. It really is. It, it really, yeah, you couldn't do any better than that. You really couldn't. And I, so, I, I think that I actually, actually, I think the only way it could have been better is if you had Gerald Ford doing July 4th of 76 and December 31st, but obviously that w- wouldn't necessarily work because it seems like everybody had one minute. You didn't have repeat guests. Yeah. Outside of, again, Kukulfran and Ali, assuming, you know, one person spoke on one day, the other spoke on the other, what have you. Yeah. So we went over all the minutes. There has to be some sort of lasting legacy of all the minutes. Right, Greg? Oh, yeah. Because in popular culture, this achieved a high cultural profile during its run and was widely referenced on shows like All in the Family, Sanford and Stun, and The Sunny and Cher Show. The Carol Burnett Show. And in fact, Mike, we were watching the New Year's Eve 1976 episode of Match Game 76. And do you want to describe what we saw? If you remember Match Game on their New Year's Eve shows or the last shows of the year, they would do a transition of sorts. They would change the number on the sign. They'd go from 73 to 74, 74, 75, so on and so forth. So in 76, they obviously transitioned to 77. And Charles Nelson Riley introduced this character, which was known as the Goody Toddy Bird. And it rang in the new year of 77 by laying an egg that had match game 77 on it. And there was actually a comment by Charles Nelson Riley that this was officially the last bicentennial moment. I don't think he called it a bicentennial minute, but he, he officially like declared the bicentennial moments are done because 1976 is over. Which makes sense. Which makes a ton of sense. But also, on the April 24th, 1976 episode of SNL, and I want to mention this, host Raquel Welch appeared at a sketch entitled Bisexual Minutes. We're in a bicentennial themed bikini. She announces, Good evening, I'm Gore Vidal. Miss Welch had previously appeared in the film My Rip Breckenwich, which was based on the novel of the same name by Mr. Vidal, a noted bisexual. God bless America. Mm-hmm. Oh my. Oh my goodness. And, and it was even mentioned as late as. Uh... Uh, an episode of The King of Queens where Arthur, of course, played by Jerry Stiller, references throwing a pair of glasses at the TV during a particularly offensive bicentennial minute. Wow. Jerry Stiller. Yeah, Yeah, what a deep cut. Jerry Stiller getting upset about something. Yeah. But also, like, 30 years after the fact. That, I think, is the most amazing part of that. Oh, yeah, definitely. That might be a little uh, esoteric of a reference for people watching that show if they weren't around in 76. But uh, this wasn't just limited to American influence because in the 70s and in up to 1991 and 2012 even, CBC and CTV in Canada produced the Heritage Minute. It was sponsored by uh, the Historica Dominion Institute, Bell Canada, and uh, the Power Corporation of Canada, and the National Film Board. Wow. Okay. And it started, what, in 1991? And it led up to the uh, 150th anniversary of Canada's founding uh, in 2012. So That's a long run. It is a long run. And they referenced it on an episode of Canada's Drag Race, where the main challenge is based on parodying Heritage Minutes as her Heritage Minutes. Oh, just like bisexual minutes. Yeah. So a long legacy of this sort of forgotten part of television and American history, the Bicentennial Minute. 200 years ago today. It was a star-studded affair that brought together the stars of television, movies, stage, screen, literature, journalism, whatever and what have you. And for two and a half years, 
in the 1970s as part of America's Bicentennial, it was a thing on TV. Yeah, I wouldn't be against it being revived for the Sester Centennial in five years. That's the 250th anniversary, yes. by the way. I, yeah, yeah, d- I, d- 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 just for the folks at home who don't have their, their big college dictionary with them. But I wouldn't be against that. Uh, I'm sure that CBS or whatever station probably wouldn't do it because that's not really generating a ton of money because you could use that for advertising space. Revenue. But, but, but also I could see it maybe if it was like a PSA kind of something, like uh, if it fell under like the ad council, maybe if it fulfilled some sort of... Uh, Educational informational television requirement. Well, that or, again, like a PSA, because obviously there's PSAs throughout network television. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could see that working. And honestly, as an educator, I say anything that helps students learn and gain more knowledge, especially nowadays since, you know, we, we've got history that was taught in school and now we have, like, the real history coming out. I think people would be interested in the real history. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, there's got to be more stories deeper into what we saw 45 years ago. So I, I w- would love to see it again. Will it happen? Probably not, but it doesn't hurt to dream. And, and it, again, it would be a great thing to raise the collective American spirit as we get closer to that 250th anniversary. Oh, totally, totally. Well, I have an idea. What's your idea? How about you put it on YouTube? I'm not researching 900 different entries, no. <laughs> and also, like, do, we I, gonna... I, I, do we have the money to hire Lin-Manuel Miranda? Well, I don't well, think so. Well, well, do I have the time to be researching an entry from, let's say, you know, January uh, 9th of 1775? No, I, I, I don't really have the time to be you know, doing copious notes or going through a ton of research, but... Again, it's good to dream, but yeah, again, at what cost? And uh, would t- uh, television networks outside of maybe History Channel or Military Channel would they have any interest in that? Who knows? Yeah, I was thinking History Channel might have an interest. American Heroes Channel may have an interest. PBS. PBS may have an interest. PBS, but uh, again, at what cost? Because they don't. Or, have the or biggest... it's like the worst case scenario I could think of is like a minute long vignette on radio, similar to what Sanjay Gupta does in the mornings. Yeah, I guess. It yeah, could I'm be Sanjay it. Gupta, helping you live a better life. Yeah, I could see it added on, like at the end of the hourly newscast from whatever affiliate, you know, CBS Radio or Fox Radio or what have you. I could see that happening. Okay. Well. Uh, this was a long, long episode, guys. But it was very entertaining, Greg. It was very entertaining and very educational, yes. Yes. Yeah, I think this is one of the best episodes we've done in a long time. Yeah. You want more, guys? Oh, you're going to mess this up, aren't you? I am going to mess this up, folks. Oh, boy. Because, guys, it's time to play a special Bicentennial Edition of eBay Price is Right. And you know what? We're not even going to use the Price is Right theme. We're just going to play some patriotic music. Let's do it. Okay, here we go. This installment of eBay Price is Right is brought to you by Shell. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Lay it on us. Okay, here we go. guys, you are bidding on... A 1976 Western Electric Bicentennial Pay Phone Telephone Three Coin Slot Rotary Dial. Wow, that is very America. Okay, I was not expecting this. This is amazing here. Yeah. All right, do you want me to read the description of this? Read the description of this. Okay. 1976 Western Electric Bicentennial Pay Phone Telephone Three Coin Slot Rotary Dial. Condition is used. Shipped with USPS Parcel Select Ground. Red, white, and blue payphone with the both wall stand and mountain board in its original state. Never been painted. 
The phone is the real deal in working condition. The phone came from a restaurant in northern Michigan where it lived until my aunt and uncle purchased it when the place was remodeled years ago. It has all the normal scratches, dents, and even some small amount of paint from previous wall painting. The blue laminate is peeling on the sides. It does work, but should be reconditioned to be used as a daily phone. The cord is stretched some and turning yellow from age. There was no odor or smell from smokers back in the day, and I was surprised because the restaurant used a wood burner fireplace as a heat source for years back then, but still has very little or no odor. No keys come with it. They are lost. Please look at the pictures closely for all the wear. The red, white, and blue color is still bright and it looks good, except for the peeling of the blue at the bottom signs. Oh, okay, it looks good. It looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks really good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Oh, it looks good. Looks good. Oh, it looks good. Looks good. Oh, it looks good. Looks good. All right. That we haven't had one of those in a while. I feel. I feel whole now. Okay. Here we go. Chico, I'm starting the bidding with you. Well, with the, all the wear and tear and the discoloration from age, I can't bid more than $177.60. <laughs> Mike? <laughs> I, I, I like what he did there. Um, I'm going to give Chico a little window here. I There's a number I have in mind, but I'm not going to press my luck. That's another show. I'm going to say $195. I'm going to lock that in, but I'm going to preface this by saying I wouldn't be surprised if this went for at least 500 because, I know. Because it, it looks original. Well, it is original. They said it hasn't been painted. It's got the original stand, original everything, original cord, it seems, if That's it's yellowing. Right. I really yeah. I really think it's legitimately over $500, but just because you know, this is a game of strategy. It, plus, I, the plus the yeah, condition. I'm saying 195 Guys, here we go. You ready for the price of this? Yes. That means it's like $1,000. Probably. Six hundred and twenty-five dollars. Okay, that's believable. That is absolutely believable. Seriously, if I had the money and the space, I would buy that. I think that's cool. But could you rewire it to be an actual phone instead of just uh, a nice display piece? Well, remember the keys are missing. So if you wanted to use it, you'd have to put coins in, but you're not getting those coins out. Yeah, you may have to call in a locksmith or something. Yeah, but yeah, that is a cool piece. That's an amazing conversation piece. Yeah. Hey, do you want to know how much it costs to ship this? How much does it cost to ship that? Fifty-eight dollars and seventy cents. Oh, that's not See, too bad. I was expecting a hundred dollars. Yeah, I was just about to say. Now, for for the price, I totally see that. For the price, I totally see that. Well, guys, this has been a great episode. Honestly, uh, we have a whole lot of episodes just like this one. Some of them aren't as good, but they're just like this one. At our website, it was a thing on TV.com. There you can also find our social feeds, links to our YouTubes, and of course, links to our good friends at the Place to Be Nation, where we have the weekly drops. And I believe this week we are dropping the Tonight Show with oh, Conan O'Brien. And we yeah. got, of course,. Andy Richter's visit to spring training in 1995 for the Mets. Diesel! Where he met Diesel. And, and don't forget O'Hara. Yes. O'Hara, too, yeah. Yes. So there you go. That's all happening. And, of course, uh, we also do drops on our YouTube. And if you go to our YouTube, don't forget to smack the bell. The Liberty Bell, I should say. Yeah. Oh, sorry. To stay up to date on future entries. Greg, what do we have next week? Oh, next week, guys. We're, <laughs> could you believe a TV legend of the 1970s had his own variety show special? Yeah. Everybody had a variety show special back in the 70s. Yeah. 
Well, I got four words to say to you. Who loves you, baby? Oh, my. I could see him hosting a variety special. What with his charisma, his savoir faire, and his, of course, large Q rating. And we're also going to talk about something that is quintessential 70s, but on the bad side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so next week we have everything that was right with the 70s and everything that was wrong with the 70s in a single week. Yes. And your opinion on which is the good and which is the bad may vary. Oh, totally. But they don't use the term demolition night for good things. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Again, your mileage may vary. Yeah, there you go. And that will be coming up next time on It Was a Thing on TV. I'm Chico Alexander. That's Greg Diener. That's Mike Klaus. And that's the way it was. This special episode was not sponsored by Shell. Well, aren't you decked out? What? I'm, you look lovely. Thank you. I have a special announcement. You do? Yes, I brought a special friend. Yes. Uh, sir, will you come down, please? Oh, my God. <laughs> First of all, Charles. No, don't be nervous. Well, wait a minute. Charles. You see, the thing about it, the, the, the bird has been sedated by the ASPCA with a needle, so it's fine. Don't want anyone to panic. And if you just go down to your usual place, the bird will... It's a goody toddy bird. A goody toddy bird? Toddy bird. You mean the bird? The bird is. It is a goody toddy. Oh, the bird is flying! The bird is flying. Has been sedated. Yes. It is a. It is a goody toddy bird. The only bird that keeps score. What What is now, this bird going to do? It is going to give us the last, thank goodness, bicentennial moment. I see. <laughs> This is CBS.